Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the annual Fundsmith shareholder meeting. It's good to see so many of you here. I think we're even up on last year's attendance. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name's Ian King. I'm the business presenter at Sky News. And joining me, of course, two gentlemen who need absolutely no introduction, Julian Robbins and, of course, Terry Smith. Now, the format uh, is uh, pretty similar to last year. You write in with your questions for Terry and Julian, and the Fundsmith people then very helpfully uh, put them into a big, long list for me to look at, and then I decide which ones we're going to put to Terry and Julian on the night. So if your question doesn't get asked, don't blame them, you can blame me. Uh, but the good news is, if your question isn't answered this evening, Fundsmith will get in touch with you. Your question will be answered. It just won't be uh, on this uh, platform tonight necessarily. But uh, everyone who has written in with a question will get an answer. And uh, I should also just remind you, my interests are very much aligned with yours. I have money with Fundsmith, and so do all of my uh, children. They have uh, some of their... Uh, long-term savings tied up with Fundsmith as well. So my interests are very much aligned with yours. I'm just as uh, eager to know what Terry and Julian have to say to your questions as you are. Without further ado then, let's crack on and let me hand over to Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see so many of you here again. Uh, we obviously, we made it back from COVID after I managed to catch it on one occasion a while back, but uh, it's good to see you in person, really. Um, I'm going to do the usual run-through. Um, don't expect me to say anything that you don't really already know, because that's the whole point in many respects, that we hope we communicate to you what we do and what we've done uh, well enough for you to be able to stand up here and do this if you want, uh, basically. I've done. Uh, and uh, I will spend a bit more time on performance than I usually do because uh, I want to go through some background on that because I think it's quite important and then we're going to hand back to Ian to bowl the questions at us, okay? Um, there's a disclaimer, as you know, you should read it. Our regulator requires you to see it. As you know, I always paraphrase it if you've been here before. Uh, basically, it says if you trust me and buy the fund, it's your problem, not mine. As I said, I'm going to talk a bit about performance, a few slides on performance, and then I'm going to go through the investment strategy. Again, you know the strategy by now, I hope. We've made it quite clear from the outset what it is, but really we tell you about the strategy so that you can judge whether or not we're still keeping to it. Uh, one of the dangers of fund managers is so-called style drift. They go off and do something else uh, when it seems to suit them, and you can judge whether or not we're doing that when you see that. Okay. Performance. There's performance. You'll see that uh, last year we returned... 12.4%, there it is. Uh, the market, which is the MSCI, in sterling, with dividends were invested 16.8%, so we underperformed about 4%, but we made some money, which is nice, better than the previous year. And there's January in there, 2.7% up, and I think February, we're up about another 5%, something like that, to date. More importantly, I think, uh, is there's our long-term performance. I, I know that some of you, like me, have, have shared in that, which is good. That's what we do have our eyes on. We don't have it on a particular year, uh, or years even. We, uh, we look at the long-term performance. And this is a thing called the Saltino ratio over here, which basically measures how much return you get for how much volatility there is in the unit price, basically. So it's a measure of, to some degree at least, of how much risk is being taken uh, to attain the returns. Because you can see some people who get great returns but the, uh, the, the degree of movement is considerably greater than, the, than we've had, uh, and that can have some adverse effects in terms of your decision-making and ours and how we all feel about it. Um, you'll see, compared with the market, over the period since we've been going, we've outperformed it by about 4% during the period, and uh, the Saltino ratio, this measure of risk-adjusted return, is about twice what the market is, which is kind of what we're aiming for, I suppose. Um, the only other thing to remark about here is last year, Bonds delivered a pretty decent return. You know, you, uh, you have to bear in mind when you're investing now, whether you're investing with us or anybody else, that Uncle Sam uh, will give you 5% without any risk whatsoever. And that's quite a, a high bar for anybody to jump over in terms of a return. And if you look at how funds have been selling in the last year or year and a half, something like that, the biggest selling funds are, are, are short-term funds in, in, in fixed income because that's a decent return. Um, what worked and what didn't? So the top five performers and the top five detractors, show those to see what we can learn. Our biggest performer last year was Meta Platforms, the old Facebook. And if you read the annual letter, you'll see that I say in there, only half jokingly, 
uh, that I'm thinking of starting a new fund, which each year will only own one share. It'll be a different share uh, each year, or rotate into a new share each year, and the sole, the sole criterion for that one share will be the one we get the most criticism for owning. We got a barrage of criticism over, over the, uh, the Facebook holding, and um, there it is. Um, Microsoft, second best performer. You could say much the same about Microsoft. If we look back to our annual meeting for the year when we bought it and the questions and comments, there was a lot of criticism of us buying uh, Microsoft at about $25 or $26, which uh, is a long way short of where it is now, which is 400 and something. I can't remember exactly. Julian knows these things better than me. A more important point is this is the eighth time that I've shown Microsoft in the largest contributors. Um, uh, the way I usually express it is you make money with old friends. You know? If you've got something big like this that you get right, the likelihood is it's going to continue to be right. Um, I'm not a gardener, but I'm told what you're supposed to do is water the flowers and pull up the weeds. An awful lot of people do it the other way around. They sell the things that have worked and hope, hang on to the things which are, are not working in the hope they'll come right. I, our strategy, and I think in my view the correct way to do it, is the opposite of that, to run our big winners. Uh, Novo Nordisk, if you hadn't heard of them a year or so ago, yeah, I bet you've heard of them now. This is the company uh, which is the world's leader in the treatment of diabetes, uh, which came out with the first effective weight drug, uh, Wegovy or Ozempic, depending upon what the label is on it, uh, which is currently taking the world by storm, not just in diabetes and weight loss, but also uh, its efficacy for other comorbidities, so to speak, which is uh, it's now got labels for cardiovascular, it's going to get labels, I think, for treatment of kidney, liver, uh, probably arresting Alzheimer's, autoimmune conditions like arthritis, lupus, etc., um, and so on. And uh, that's actually making its fourth appearance in this table, to give you that theme again. Um, we own Novo Nordisk long before the words weight loss were ever used in association with it. What really attracted us was the, the company's approach to drug discovery. Um, L'Oreal, uh, one of our favourite stocks, as you know, if you've listened to us before, this is its second appearance in this table. Uh, uh, IDEX Laboratories, lastly, this is the leading manufacturer of veterinary diagnostic equipment and supplies in the world. Uh, that's making its fifth appearance in this table, so I think you get a theme there. What didn't work? Estee Lauder. Ironic when you think L'Oreal was one of our best performers and Estee Lauder was one of our worst. Estee Lauder ran into a problem uh, with having completely misjudged the China reopening and, and the retail uh, reop uh, reopening in travel. And uh, as a result, had a $500 million stock write-off, which is quite bad. But more importantly, we think exposed some real weaknesses in the supply chain that they had uh, and also some weaknesses in their management. And so as a result, we actually sold it in the middle of last year. So it was, one of, it was our worst performer, but it was gone. Uh, in the middle of the year, actually. And we don't think we'll probably own it again unless or until there's a change in, in the fundamental management of the business. McCormick, largest manufacturer and supplier of spices and condiments in the world. They've got two businesses, essentially. One supplies retail, uh, stuff that we buy to do cooking at home, and one supplies food service, so restaurants, particularly quick service, fast food, um, casual dining restaurants. With that split of business, they had a very good time during the pandemic with cooking at home and a very bad time with restaurants. And of course, that's now reversed. And the, the restaurant business, uh, the, the food service business, is smaller than the home retail business. So the home retail business is now coming off, some, as a lot of businesses are, some very strong pandemic performance. And there's not enough in the, in the food service business to compensate for that slight drag. Um, also, the food price inflation, the input inflation, has left this company with gross profit margins about three and a bit points, 3.3 points, lower than they were before the inflation. They haven't yet managed to catch up. And again, it seems to us this is at least partly, only partly, a systems thing, that their, their techniques for getting the price up to their, uh, their customers, the supermarkets, uh, don't react quickly enough. So a little bit of a concern about that. You'll see there are two drinks companies here, Diageo and Brown Foreman. Uh, in these detractors. The drinks companies generally are coming off a, uh, a high during the pandemic when some people thought that people not going into work would lead people to drink less. In fact, they drank quite a lot more. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in the least bit surprised by that. And uh, that's obviously a high that they're coming off. Diageo has also run into a particular problem. Uh, the downturn in demand in Latin America seems to have caught them by surprise as to how much stock was in their supply chain between them and the consumers in distributors and retail and bars and so on. So we're a bit disappointed by their control of, uh, of their uh, supply chain into distribution in there. And Brown Foreman is affected by the same 
pandemic highs in drinking and coming off it, but there are no operational problems in there. Lastly, Metla Toledo. This is the world's biggest manufacturer of weighing equipment, everything from your supermarket scales through to things that can measure a nanoparticle. Um, it's used in laboratories and bioprocessing and food processing applications. It also makes a lot of other things that go into that area, things like pipetting equipment for bioprocessing and pharmaceutical manufacture. All the companies that supply stuff that goes into laboratories are suffering from the same kind of detrimental things at the moment, which is to say the coming off the COVID purchasing high. And so the comparatives are quite tough for them. And the fact that China is not purchasing as much of this equipment as they were a year or two ago. Um, Metla Toledo has also got a, a, a local problem, which is they switched their logistics base in the Netherlands from one supplier to another and, and managed to drop some orders in the process of doing it. But we're pretty confident that will come back and that we're dealing with a high quality business. So we're not all that concerned. So that's what worked and what didn't work. Um, I said a bit more about performance this year than I normally do because it's been a peculiar period. People say, oh, well, you know, you've had three years of, of, of underperformance, which is quite literally true, um, but I'm inclined to somewhat ignore that year because we were up 22%, 22.1, the market was 22.9. It's kind of like, if you want to give us grief for 22.1, let me know. So I'm really, I'm really interested in, in these years here, 22 and, and 23 in terms of performance, uh, where we did underperform, uh, and I'd like to talk about why, because I think it's just to learn something out of, out of that and see if um, we can think about how we manage money uh, and how you as investors trust us with it and whether it's appropriate. This is um, 2023 performance for something that you've heard probably if you read the financial pages called The Magnificent Seven. So brokers who want to get you to do things have wonderful ways of inventing names for things. Uh, the bricks, the Magnificent Seven, the fangs, etc., etc., etc. The Magnificent Seven are these stocks, seven stocks listed here. Um, you'll see that the NASDAQ, the uh, US index, delivered 43% return last year, a lot. That's a lot. Right? These seven stocks delivered two-thirds of that return. If you didn't own all or most of these stocks, it was close to impossible to outperform, basically. Um, looking at them, we don't own any NVIDIA. Uh, and I know that um, Ian, who does alert us if he's got a question that we need slides for, has got a question for us later on about the um, hype, if that's what it is, or the story around um, AI, which has driven this company, which designs chips for the GPUs, which are uh, used driving the, uh, the models for AI. Um, we don't own any that. We do own some meta platforms. We're never going to own Tesla. Uh, we did own Amazon, and I sold it. We'll probably deal with that a bit later in terms of how, how good or bad an idea that one was. We own Alphabet. We do own Microsoft. We do own some Apple, but we own a very small amount of Apple. And the reason for that is we started buying it a year and a half ago um, when it was rated about the same as the S&P index. We thought, if it's the same as the S&P index in rating, we're probably all right because it's a lot better than the S&P average. Started buying it, and we foresaw correctly that it was going to have a series of quarters of poor sales. Uh, coming up. It's had five or six in a row since we started buying. The only thing we didn't foresee is that the share price would go up 50% while that was happening. <laughs> uh, so we haven't got enough Apple, or we didn't have enough Apple. So, you know, that was one of, that was the 2023 background to performance, just to let you know, okay? And just to give you a reflection on it, The Magnificent Seven. I'm a, I, I like movies a lot. I'm very keen on movies. And I think you can learn a lot from movies. Uh, one of the things that I think you learn if you watch enough of them is there's no such thing as a new movie plot. Everything's been done before, basically. It all gets rerun. And the Magnificent Seven, which they've used as this term for these seven stocks, which drove the market performance last year, of course, comes from the 1960 movie of the same name. Have we seen this movie before? You bet we have, because in 1954, The Seven Samurai uh, was released. And uh, the Magnificent Seven is clearly a copy of it. They just wear cowboy hats and carry guns instead of swords and so on. Um, so we have seen this movie before. And you know, the Magnificent Seven Stocks, we've seen this movie before. In 7th of April 2000, Goldman Sachs uh, named their Super Seven. Uh, I'm guessing that they maybe had somebody who liked Lotus or Cater and Cars on the staff at the time for Super Seven. Um, and here they are, First Data, Oracle, Teradyne, PMC, EMC Squared, Cisco and Dell. Those were the Magnificent Seven of 2000. How did they do? 
There you go. There's the next five years performance there, and there's the next uh, 10 years performance there, basically. Uh, Julian and his team, who have to prepare these things I dream up from time to time, struggled to find some of these because they barely exist anymore, you know, in terms of where they, they got to after this. And there's a great saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Right? And uh, I think we may find that if we had on your behalf, entered into a full-blown Let's Own the Magnificent Seven last year, we might eventually be into uh, watching the, uh, the sequel to it uh, and uh, with the same outcome, basically. Um, just to give you one other illustration, this is about how this is a portfolio and um, we have to be... It's nice to own things that go up a lot, it's great, but you have to be a little bit careful about what you get on the way to them going up a lot and how it affects our decisions and your decisions. Here's a stock, a real stock. You could have bought it in February 2018 at $127 a share. Uh, by September of 2021, it was at 273, so it had more than doubled. And recently, it's been trading at $484. Uh, so it made 196% return during the, uh, the, the five and a bit years in there. Pretty good, isn't it? Want to own it? I won't own it. I'm in, if you are. Um, the problem is it did this, right? Yeah, it went from there to there, which is what you've just seen, but it had these three really big downturns. One of them was 76%, right? How would you feel if you owned this stock? Even though we now know, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, that it was a great returner, how would you feel round about there? Yeah? Now, I can tell you how I felt, because it's meta platforms, right? <laughs> That's what we've, we've lived with through this. And to give you a, a picture of what this is, what we manage is a portfolio. It has some things in there which are quite staid, which don't ever produce returns like this. You know, the Unilevers and the Procter and Gambles and the PepsiCo's of this world. We don't own all of these. Even if we thought we could identify a Magnificent Seven, we would not take the risk of owning them. Right? Because they can do things like that. And when they do things like that, it causes you to get worried, and us to get worried, and both of us quite possibly to make bad decisions based upon those emotions. Um, the, the meta platform story, I was in, in New York, sort of round about here at one point, um, meeting with a, a big um, wealth management private office that we've managed money for in the United States, and the young associate, or younger than me anyway, associate was giving me a, a reasonable hard time about meta and what we thought about it, and I was giving him our answers and so on, and his uh, much older and obviously wiser boss, uh, uh, said, every portfolio should have one stock like that. If you believe what you're saying, you should buy more. And we did. And it worked. And is it great? The most important thing that that man said to me was one stock. Right? You don't want 27 of them. Because <laughs> if they all move in unison like that, I'm afraid it's game over. Right? We're not all going to have the fortitude to live through that, even if we should have in the end. This is another thing we did just to explain what's been going on in the world. These are 241 companies, which we got from screening. And these 241 companies are companies which have got market value of 15 billion or more. So they're big enough for us to own. And they are companies which produced a total return over the 2022-23 period of 20%. Why, do, why would you choose 20%? It was a nice round number. Um, but it's also actually it's 9.5 percent per annum compound. That gets you to 20 percent over two years. 9.5 percent is actually the long-term average return on equities. So these are companies over this period which are big enough to own and which produced the market return or better. So why didn't we own them? And I think looking at them gives you a picture of what a peculiar period this is. 45 of them were energy stocks. We don't own any energy stocks. We're never going to own an energy stock. In 2022, which we, I was talking about as the other uh, one of the two years, if you did not own an energy stock, it was just about impossible to outperform. Okay? Um, in, we don't own any energy stocks. We're never going to. We don't own insurance stocks. We don't own very much in industrials. Information technology, yep, we're quite keen on that. And there's our friends NVIDIA. Here's another reflection for you. This is two years, remember, 20% returns or greater. Of that magnificent seven that shot the lights out, no pun intended, uh, in 2023, only one of them, NVIDIA, made it into this list. If you'd have owned the magnificent seven for two years instead of one, you'd have underperformed. You, so, you know, there's increasing signs there, in my view, of a fad. And we've said from the outset, we don't do fads. Banks, we don't do banks, really. Consumer services, ah, oh, right, this is right up our alleyway. We could have owned some consumer services stocks.
Pinduo Duo is the one that gave the best performance. We're talking about a Chinese uh, e-commerce company headquartered in Dublin and listed in America. Hmm. No red flags there at all. Um, financial information services, we don't really do much in financials. Aerospace and defense, no. Pharmaceuticals, we do it. Obviously, we've got that one, so that's good. Uh, building, no, we don't do building. Mining, not on your Nelly. Consumer products is another one we could do, isn't it? We like consumer products. But look at what the companies are that perform well generally. Decker's Outdoors, if you're unfamiliar with it, this is the manufacturer of Ugg boots. My particular favorite is this. The second best performing consumer product stock during the two years was Axon Enterprise. Anyone know what Axon Enterprise makes? Consumer product, tasers. <laughs> Not likely to be one for us, really, when you think about it. What I'm saying here is this was a very, very peculiar period in terms of performance that basically, I think, to have performed well in terms of outperforming the market consistently across those two years, you would have had to own energy and an awful lot of other garbage, frankly, and then pirouetted, rather like someone doing a triple salco, into the, the Magnificent Seven, uh, at, at somewhere around about half point. And um, if you can do that, let me know, because I, we definitely can't do it. We're, and we're not even going to try, basically. The last thing to say on that one is those businesses that you had to own to perform, those mining businesses and so on, this is the Stern Business School of, uh, of New York University, published this table pretty regularly. And it's their examples of good and bad business. They define that in pretty much the same way that we do. They take the return on capital employed for the companies, take off the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC, which is just a guess on how much their capital costs. So they get one minus the other, and they tell you whether the companies make a positive spread when they take money in from the market and do their business, or whether they make a negative spread, whether they're destroying value or creating value. These ones on the left are creating value, these ones are destroying. You can see what creates value. Tobacco, ironic, I know, but it does. Information services, healthcare support, advertising, household products, computer services, beverages. We're in. We like that. It's all good stuff, right? Over here, things that destroy value. Brokerage and investment banking. I'm shocked. Shocked. <laughs> Frankly, shocked. Banks. You know what Julian and I feel about banks. Financial services, ditto. Uh, oil and gas, no. Air transport. Um, I, I, every time I fly, I, I remember the mantra, the only two things you can achieve by owning an airline. Upset people and lose money. Uh, REITs, real estate investment trusts, autos and trucks, real estate, real estate. The thing about owning the things on the previous slide, most of which fall into those bad businesses, is this. Good businesses don't become bad businesses and vice versa very much. You know, if you look at this data over many, many years, and this is uh, here, uh, you can see 10 years of data. They don't change very much. Yep. Bad businesses do have their day in the sun. Every dog has its day. Their share price does perform for a period, but they don't become good businesses that you want to own as a result. Anyway, that's performance. You've survived that bit, well done. Um, investment strategy. Our simple three-step strategy. Try to only invest in good companies. Try not to overpay. Do nothing. Only invest in good companies. Every year we show you this. This is our table of so-called look-through ratios. We take our portfolio, calculate these ratios for it, weight the result for each company to show its position in the portfolio, and we give you the total number, and we compare it with the indices and over time, so you can see how it's changing. We always talk about return on capital employed as probably the biggest indicator of financial performance. You can see last year, 32%, an all-time high for the portfolio. Uh, the indices, whether it's the S&P or the FTSE, about 17 or 18 percent. So we're doing about 80 percent more than the index in terms of returns in our companies. And those margins of how much better they're doing need to be borne in mind when you get to the next set of slides, which are on valuation. Uh, basically, how much better are they? Because our companies are rarely going to be cheaper than the market. They're probably going to be more highly rated, but it doesn't make them expensive. It depends what, you're, what quality you're getting. Gross margin, this is the difference between um, sales revenues and the cost of goods sold. So the things that come into the company, the components, the ingredients, the services that they do something with and they then have a service and a product that they sell the consumers, uh, that, that tells you this. Our company's 63%, which is pretty much in line with the long-term average. To put it in English, they're taking things in for 37, their inputs, and selling their, their output for 100. The index is 45, 41%. The companies in the index are taking things in that cost 60 and selling it for 100. It's better to 
buy something for 37 and sell it for 100, then 60 and sell it for 100, fairly obviously. And also, it's the big protection against inflation. When you get input cost inflation, the higher your gross margin, the less you have to put up your end price to reflect the, the, the inflation in your input costs. Take out all the other expenses in a company, you get to the operating profit margin. You can see last year, 29%. Again, I think it's an all-time high, certainly a high for the last eight years. Getting on for twice the index. Cash conversion, this is a funny one. Not every pound of profits arrives in cash. Some of it goes into working capital in terms of stocks and payables and so on. Um, last year it was 91%. It's a bit below the long-term average. You can see it's around 100. Um, and it's recovered, though, from there. Our companies had an interesting time during the pandemic. The, the disruption of supply chain turned an awful lot of them from companies which bought things just in time to companies that needed to buy things just in case. Uh, when, they need, when they could lay their hands on something, they bought it basically, ranging from bleach to semiconductors, they basically said, look, we need this to finish the product, and uh, um, therefore we're just going to buy it when it's available, which obviously uh, uh, didn't do wonders for their cash flow during this period. It is beginning to recover, as you can see. The market, you can see here, the index is about 75 85%. It, ours has typically been better than that, and I think it's on a recovery trend towards being better than that once again. Finally, interest cover, though they've got debts and leases, the profits provide a cover for that. How many times their interest bill are their profits? You can see our company is 20 times. That's as high as it's ever been by that year there. And it's about twice the index. These are very conservatively financed companies. They do not deliver performance through clever financial engineering. I think we could represent to you we've got good companies. Don't overpay. We calculate this on our companies every day and every year. Free cash flow yield. We take the cash the company generates, free cash flow, and divide it by the market value. Market value, and we get this number, 3%. Um, obviously, the lower that is, the more expensive they are. Just like a bond, the lower the yield, the more expensive this is. Um, the FTSE gives you a free cash flow yield of about 5.5%. It is rated at half what our companies are rated. And there's an awful lot of debate about whether or not the FTSE as a result is cheap. Um, and I think Ian's got a question for us on that as well. Yeah, got a question for us on that. So I won't dwell on that too much. I'll just leave that until we get to there. The S&P, we're much closer to the S&P in valuation. You see that 3.7%. Yeah, we're a bit more expensive, about 20%. The question you and we have got to ask ourselves is, is what we've got more than 20% better than the average in the index? And I would say, yeah, I think it is. Uh, here's a clue. Last year, that free cash flow grew by 14%. That's a hell of a rate for companies of this size. Right? And part of that is their natural growth in sales and the products. Part of it is the recovery in that free cash conversion I was talking to you about earlier. And that, I think, is going to probably continue, subject to no recessions or other interruptions, through 2024, that we're going to see pretty substantial growth in the free cash flow, which will make this valuation lower over time. Okay? Do nothing, finally. Here's what we bought and sold in 2023. I won't go into how well or badly it did, um, partly because I just really don't want to, but <laughs> partly also because I'm pretty sure he's got that for us as well, because he gives us warning of anything that we have to make a slide up for. He's going to ask us something about that. We sold Adobe. We bought Adobe pretty well during the downturn in 2022. It's a, the world's a leading uh, maker of um, software for graphics. Uh, you all use PDF files, I would think, which is one of their main products. Um, we bought it well, did well for us, and then they announced the acquisition of a thing called Figma, which is a competitor uh, which has cracked the uh, desire to operate collaboratively on uh, software for graphics over the internet. Uh, they agreed to pay $20 billion for it, which is quite a lot of money in my view, um, and they wouldn't tell us a single number, not a single number. Um, uh, they said they'd signed an NDA, a no disclosure agreement, which didn't allow it, which begs the question, why did you sign that? Hmm? Um, anyway, because it was a large private company, we could get some numbers anyway. Uh, and they were paying about eight times revenues for it, which is a pretty stiff old price. And we thought it revealed a, uh, a fundamental weakness that they'd identified in their business, that this competitor had achieved this. And we also thought they were quite possibly not going to be able to cover that competitive threat by buying Figma, even though they were trying to, because we thought the competition regulators would be very anti uh, a large tech company taking out a competitor given the way that things have gone in the tech sector in recent years. Um, so we sold the shares. Uh, they then abandoned the acquisition, paid a $1 billion break fee, uh, and the share price went up. So don't I feel bad. There we go. Uh, right decision, wrong outcome probably. Um, ditto with Amazon. Um, we bought Amazon when it was on its way down from the, uh, the highs of the pandemic, uh, having 
basically extrapolated the growth in e-commerce demand and built facilities for demand that wasn't going to be there for the next year or two. Um, and that was all good. And, and we'd always liked the Amazon web service business, so we didn't have to worry too much about that. And then the relatively new chief executive, Mr. Jassy, made remarks about wanting to go big in grocery retail online, uh, which in our view is disastrously stupid, I'm afraid. Um, and, uh, and so we sold it. Um, we may, of course, have done a disservice by being very vocal about that. Not that I overestimate or even our, our impact on anything in life, but he hasn't actually done it. So the thing we worried about hasn't occurred. Um, but we really don't like people who start saying they're going to do things which we think are, are a very bad allocation of, of our capital and your capital. We sold Estee Lauder, which I think I've covered already. What did we buy? Bought Procter & Gamble, the world's biggest consumer products company. We've owned it before. We sold it before because it had kind of stalled in growth terms. The management didn't seem to understand you need to sell more stuff. They thought you could get there by just putting the price up, as any of you who buy razor blades will have noticed in recent times. Um, and we needed them to change that mindset. Nelson Peltz got involved, topically, because of course he's involved in Unilever now, and I think managed to change their mind about the need to have volume growth. And they also did some very good things with regard to pruning the, the product portfolio. They sold their food business, which is not unnatural for them. They're in personal and household care products. They sold the food business to Kellogg, and they sold their beauty business to Coty, which was disastrous for Coty. Um, and uh, we thought that was, they were really very good moves, actually. We don't think that beauty businesses sit very well within fast-moving consumer goods businesses. We don't think they're good custodians. We think uh, the best beauty businesses in the world have got family control stakes in them because they need to make decisions which uh, only really long-term shareholders should do. We bought Marriott. Um, Marriott's the biggest hotel company in the world. doesn't own any hotels, or very many. It's a hotel franchise. It has hotel brands. If you're a real estate investor, you can build a hotel. Uh, sign an agreement with Marriott, uh, put one of their brands on it and use their reservation and management systems and you pay them a, uh, a franchise fee. It's an asset light model. They make great returns as a result of that. It's the biggest in the world and it's one of those areas where big really does deliver advantages. They've got the biggest loyalty program in the world. People come back to them as a result of the using their loyalty program. Uh, the loyalty program also gives them the biggest direct booking experience in the world. They have more direct bookings than any other hotel group, which cuts out the need to pay fees to online travel agents, saves them about 25 bucks a night in terms of cost to getting you into the hotel. And they've got the best range of, uh, of hotel brands and sites in the world. Super luxury through to economy, through to long stay, which also attracts real estate uh, investors who have to supply the buildings here. Because if you're a real estate investor and you've got a good experience with Marriott in one brand, you might just build something in another Marriott brand if you want to work with them. And so that seems to work quite well. So we bought that, it's done very well so far. Last, and by no means least, we started buying Fortinet. Fortinet is the, in a, basically a duopoly uh, in the area of uh, cyber security. They provide the FortiGate uh, firewall system and the associated software. Um, and uh, their big competitor is Palo Alto Networks. Uh, Fortinet was a company that was doing very well. Uh, going along at 20% per annum growth, which was pretty good. And then when people reverted to working from home during the pandemic, they went to 30% per annum growth because lots of people like our IT people had to come around and put a 40-gate uh, firewall into my house. Otherwise, I'd have lost all your data very quickly, which you'd have been very upset about, I suspect. Um, and so they had 30% growth for a couple of years. And funnily enough, if you have 30% growth when you normally get 20, you're going to come off that high. They've gone back to about 10% growth, and the market being what it is, the share price uh, performed very badly. So we've started buying a stake in Fortinet. We're of the view that warnings, which is what they're, they're basically giving about, you know, what their growth is going to be for a few quarters or a year, don't come in ones. They come in threes. So we basically buy about a third of a stake every time they have a warning, uh, and that's what we're busy doing at the moment. Um, all of that activity... Uh, amounted to 11% portfolio turnover last year. A bit higher than our normal, not the highest it's ever been. Still not a lot. The latest Morningstar data uh, suggests that the average fund manager turned over their portfolio in the same period about 60%, basically. Uh, we saw a very low turnover. You can judge that by the costs down here. We spent £1.8 million on dealing uh, on a £24 billion fund. That's 0 0.008 of a percent, just, just, just less than one basis point, one hundredth of a percent. So we're just a bit less than that, basically. So we didn't spend a lot of money dealing. And that, I think, is it for me. I'm going to hand you back to Ian. Thanks, Terry. Um, our first question comes from uh, Hugh Tinsley. Uh, Hugh, thank you for your question. 
And what is the team's view of the likely investment impact of a Trump victory in this year's election? Not a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, bear in mind my our view that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. I mean, we have had this before. Well, if he does get in, it won't be his first outing. And that's the, form, the previous Trump presidency for you in terms of its effect on the MSCI World Index. Uh, you can see that the, uh, uh, the man was uh, uh, elected, took office here, uh, and there he exited. And over the period that he was in office, uh, uh, the index grew at 12.5% compound annual growth rate, which is about three points higher than its average. So I don't think he's going to have any impact at all, very probably. I, I was just trying to think back to 2016, um, when uh, Donald Trump was basically a, a, a twinkle in our eye in terms of politics, as to whether we'd actually discussed the likelihood of him winning. And I think we probably didn't. I think we probably did. Nobody even considered it. I mean, I'm sure everybody would have been absolutely terrified back then, and maybe they're even more terrified now. I was also, we had quite an amusing, I mean, I would say this because I wrote it, but we had quite an amusing presidential quiz for the last election. And, I mean, some of the things that, that have happened over the years, I mean, one of the problems on, on April the 15th, 1865, was not just that Abraham Lincoln lay dying, but that the vice president couldn't be found because he'd been out the night before and was completely inebriated. <laughs> and even when they did find him, they couldn't actually wake him up. The America, I mean, I, I live in America, I, I will presumably have D. Trump on my ballot paper come November. The, the, the whole basis behind the, uh, the Constitution is, and the American system of government is actually, if you think about it, to prevent almost anything happening, um, which is unlike some other countries. And, 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 and my last comment is, Warren Buffett has actually been asked about it several times, about what, what is the role of the American president. And he said the only role of the American president is to avoid getting into a nuclear confrontation. Other than that, the American tailwind will survive. So um, I, I agree with Terry. I think, I think the impact is likely to be pretty minimal. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I think... I do remember it back there. We didn't discuss it, but I did discuss it with one of our non-executives who's sitting over there uh, and, uh, and pointed out to him when he was doing a lot of fretting that, to echo your point, the American Constitution has more checks and balances probably than any other constitution on earth. And uh, therefore, perhaps we shouldn't be too worried. Very good. Hope that puts some people's minds at ease. <laughs> this next one's from Ian Bridey. You've said in the past, Ian says... Uh, the investable universe for Fundsmith was around 75 companies. He wants to know how many you look at beyond that. And secondly, and again you touched on this, is Fundsmith being almost fully invested at times, is that a drag on investment returns? Do you want to do the IU? Yeah, so for, for those of you who, who kind of uh, have heard the term investable universe, because we're not the only people who use it, what is it? The, the difference between not just us, but some other people, is that we start off by saying we want to find, first off, what are the good companies out there? What are the companies that fit through our criteria, our quality prism, if you want to call it that, in terms of, in terms of the way the companies make their money, the numbers, uh, their simple path, the path to growth? So the first thing we do is, is just look through uh, the entire market, essentially, over a certain uh, market cap, to find suitable companies, companies that look like the sort of companies we want to own. Um, and, and these, after they've gone through all the sort of usual research process, end up being our so-called investable universe. And so, so we kind of, somebody once called them guardrails, because a, a lot of uh, your other fund managers, many of whom I'm sure have great results, but they will be flitting around from Japan to value to quality to growth, depending on what's in style. We, our focus is on... on identifying good companies and using that as our investable universe. So with that said, uh, uh, the questioner quotes the number of 75, which I'm sure was right at the time. It's now 85. Um, we started out with about 53. The more the merrier, the, the bigger the... I mean, we, given we've got not any particular limitation on the number of analysts we could employ if we could find more companies, the more companies we can um, find the better because that's a, a bigger uh, roster to choose from. And then in terms of the question, uh, the question, the part of the question which says, do we spend most of our time looking at the companies in the investable universe or do we try to add? The answer is both. So we have, uh, everybody does a bit of both. Everybody's supposed to be both, uh, I think the, the phrase is increasing their knowledge on existing companies and also seeing whether there are any other companies out there some of which might have just been IPO'd or been spun off, which, which fit the criteria. Yeah, and uh, 
just on the question, it does say, do you look at companies when they become cheap or low oh, yeah. value? We tend not to do that. That's to go back to what Julian said. Our first, in terms of finding a new company, do we actually want to own it? Never mind the valuation. We'll, we'll get to that later. And we, and we may find a company that we want to own, which we never own. I mean, there are plenty of companies that we've been following for the last 14 years we have never owned. Because rightly or wrongly, we just didn't think it was the right time in terms of valuation and other factors to buy them. But our first starting point in, in identi trying to identify companies that we're not in our investor universe for candidates in there is, is this a good business? You know, if, if we basically were able to own it, would we like to own it? That's where we kick off on it. On the second part of the question, the, um, uh, you know, are we handicapped by being fully uh, invested? I think the answer is no. I'll just put up on screen for you. This is the, um, uh, the results for £10,000 invested in the S&P 500 with dividends were invested for 20 years. And it tells you what you would have got for a return over the years 20, 2002 to 2022, so you know, pretty recent 20 years. If you had bought the S&P, fully invested, reinvested the dividends, you would have got yourself a 10.7% annualised return. Remember I was talking earlier about 9.5 over longer periods of time, 9, 10, round about there. And you would have actually gone from 10,000 to 76,000. Well done. If you miss the best 10 days in those 20 years, so one day every other year on average, you would more than halve the amount of your returns. Okay? Wow. Yeah? If you miss the, the one day in each year approximately, the 20 best days, you would halve your returns again. All right? If you miss the best 40 days, so over 20 years, we're only talking about two days a year, you actually get a negative return. We actually think the handicap that mostly you're going to get is if you try and market timing and be in and out. Uh, because you, know, you don't need to miss an awful lot to take those returns down. And also, we don't feel we've got the skill to do it. And we don't actually think we know anybody else who's got the skill to do it either, uh, from what we see. So are we handicapped by being fully invested? We don't think so. But we are pretty straightforward about it. We do tell you we're fully invested. And if you want to be not fully invested, you can do that. You don't have to be invested with us all the time, and, or indeed, you, if you're in with us, maybe you've got other investments. You can, you can manage your uh, exposure to the market if, if you so wish, and good luck to you would be my view seeing this. The, pre the premise of the question shows a, a, a touching and uh, faith in investment humanity, because <laughs> if you actually read it, it says, could wait to deploy large portions of capital when you felt valuations were attractive, Pres presumably when valuations were attractive is after uh, the market's done rather poorly. Yes. Uh, and that doesn't normally tend to be the time when people say, oh... I think I'll have a few. I think, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, we hear lots... I mean, over the years, we've heard many uh, reflections of, well, I'm not buying the fund at the moment because I'm waiting for a moment of underperformance to put some money in. We're still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> we are still Very waiting. Good. Right, this next one is from uh, Jeremy Bulmer. Jeremy, thanks for your question. Uh, he says, the UK stock market is often quoted in the popular media maybe the unpopular media as well, who knows, uh, as being <laughs> unloved by investors and trading at a discount to its international peers. Our UK exposure is relatively low. Is. My question is, excluding those UK-listed companies that you've previously invested in, are there any other UK-listed gems in your investable universe that could someday make an appearance in the fund? Yeah, it's, um, it does seem to be a fairly common uh, theme about the, uh, the UK stock market. It's cheap. Uh, and so on. So we thought we'd do you a few slides on the UK stock market. Here's the, the FTSE 100 by sector. And as you know, we don't think there are very many sectors which produce the quality of returns that we expect and that we need to produce the returns for you. Uh, so how does the UK stock market, the FTSE 100, break down? Well, there are 20 financials. So you, oh, do, you, do you think we could get the sort of returns that we want out of HSBC, uh, Lloyds Bank, and the LSE? Hmm, I doubt it. Um, Consumer discretionary, again, yeah, yeah, we're quite interested in that. Flutter doesn't strike me as the quality of company that we would normally go for. Um, and we have owned IHG, it's not a bad company. Um, industrials, there's not much in industrials we like. Uh, Compass is not a bad business, I think, uh, but I'm not even sure it's an industrial. I think the labelling there is a bit odd. Consumer staples, yeah, we do like consumer staples. We own Unilever, we own Diageo, we don't own BAT. We won't own materials. We won't own communications. I mean, if you look at the share price performance of things like Vodafone, it's a tragedy, basically. Um, healthcare, we do own healthcare companies. We own both drug companies and uh, medical equipment and devices companies. But none of these make the cut. None of them are 
uh, the kind of businesses uh, in terms of returns that, that we seek, uh, basically, or in terms of their uh, financial results or their market positioning. And we would never own utilities. We would never own energy. We would never own real estate. We do like technology. Um, we have owned Sage. My own, again, I don't know. And Relks is probably the other one that we, uh, we would be interested in, the old Reed Elsevier professional publishing business. Um, but I think it's an obsession with people about the FTSE, which is understandable because, you know, obviously the majority of people in the room, I, I would imagine, live in the UK, so they get very interested in it. Um, but its significance in world investment terms is not that great. We put another stock on this slide just to give you a clue. That's the market capitalization of the FTSE. You can see there are just over two trillion pounds. That's the market capitalization of Microsoft. Um, it's actually quite a lot bigger. Uh, yeah. Now, you can read what you want into that in terms of valuation or anything else. It's just a fact that Microsoft is... It's a big, wide world out there. We don't need to worry every day about the FTSE. We could put the entire fund into Microsoft and have a 1% position in the company, yeah, just to put it in perspective. Looking at the quality of what you get, other than just going down sector and saying, no, we wouldn't own that, we wouldn't own that, and you can do that. Return on capital employed, one of our very, very important performance metrics. There are only five companies in the FTSE that have got a higher return on capital than us. Uh, so the, the three sort of permanent members are Right Move, Intercontinental Hotels, and Auto Trader, which I don't think was around when... No, probably no. Right. I, I was trying to give people we're comparing ourselves with the benefit of the doubt. So I, so I included Next, Next kind of right on the cusp of our... Uh, return. And then for some reason, well, Centrica had these giant hedging profits last year, which you'll see actually in the next slide that Centrica appears to be on a free cash flow yield of, of, of 47%. So Centrica had a funny, um, had a funny year in a good way in uh, 2023, and, and thus, because that is the numerator, I actually included it. So, so those are the five, but I would say that in most years, it's going to be either three or four. Yeah, and I, I think just listening to that list, some of those are uninvestable for us. Right move, for example. Um, apart from the fact they've now got a rather horrible looking US competitor that's loomed into view, uh, it's just too small for us. And half of the FTSE 100, 49 of them, have got returns below 10%. That's never going to make it for us. Never going to make it. Um, and you need to be careful about cheap. People say, hey, it's cheaper than other things. Remember, I said we've got a free cash flow yield of 3% on our portfolio, and the FTSE is 5.5. Looks cheap, doesn't it? But averages are funny old things, aren't they? Because they can be distorted uh, quite easily by some very big participants. Uh, and although you might say, well, why do you use them? Well, we've got to find a shorthand to communicate somehow with our investors about what we buy versus what's out there. Have a look at that, some of the companies that contribute to that 5.5% average. The free cash flow yield on Vodafone is 20%. On Centrica, it's 47%. On International Airlines, it's 30%. Blimey, there's some big distortions caused by companies with massively low ratings. And when we do these free cash flow yields, we don't include financials in the calculation because they don't re the free cash flows are not really meaningful in, in financial, particularly in banks, where basically the stock in trade is cash. So you have to go back to old-fashioned PEs. This is the banks, right? Uh, Barclays is on a P of four, uh, HSBC on five, Lloyds Bank on four and a bit, and Matt West on four and a bit. Uh, basically... An awful lot of big companies in the FTSE are distorting that valuation towards making it look low by having some shockingly low valuations. Uh, so aren't there many listed gems that are in the FTSE? No. At the, at the risk of getting very, very technical here, a lot of the banks these days are very, very keen to talk about return on tangible equity. Mm -hmm. How should investors look at that compared with, say, traditional return on capital employed? Um, I mean, they should look at return on tangible equity because um, if you look at capital employed in a bank, you get some very strange numbers because what banks basically do is they have five of capital. I mean, I'm making the numbers up, but they're not that far out. Five of equity capital, a hundred of, of liabilities. Most of them are deposits. That's what most of it is. On the other side, they have a hundred of assets. The hundred of assets produces a return of half a percent. But on, you know, on five of, of, of equity, that's 10% return. Uh, they're massively geared. Um, so you have to look at the return on equity, not the return on capital. If you do the return on capital, you're going to come up with half percent, which wouldn't be terribly good. But just as a shorthand, just to go back a bit, um, I noticed in the paper uh, in the FT this week, the, um, the chief executive of, um, of Standard Chartered described his rating on his shares as crap, uh, unquote, unquote. Um, and... Um, I think what he should go and reflect on is that the return on capital employed at Standard Chartered is 5.7%, okay? 
Now, if the return on capital employed is 5.7%, I don't know what the cost of capital is, but Julian and I, when we were growing up as brokers, were taught that if you don't know the answer to anything, it's 10%. Uh, and so it's 10%. <laughs> and, um, and so that, you know, in very round terms, that's about half that. So that's about half that. And the price to book, so the share price divided by the NAV per share, which is your tangible equity, uh, equals about 0.5. It's about right. He's making a return of about half his cost of capital, and the market's telling him that his, his bank is valued at about half its tangible equity or, or um, on that asset value. It's about right. Uh, the problem he's got isn't the share price. Um, it's this. That's the problem. I, I, you know, I have news for a lot of people, including perhaps the person who made that remark. What happens is share prices follow the fundamentals of companies, not the other way around. We've never really found an example of something which had a higher or a low share rating, and as a result, the company improved or deteriorated. We've found lots of examples where the company's performance eventually was reflected in the share price. So if he wants to improve the, sh the share price, I think that 5.7% is where he's got to aim. Very good. By the way, not to, again, not to get technical, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't get overly worked up about the difference between return on equity and return on tangible equity. In no, no, no ta not the tangible equity. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, they, 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 they quote the return on tangible equity number because it's a slightly bigger number. But yeah, I mean, the return right. is. But <laughs> and that, that age-old um, yeah. sort of approach of always, always quote the number that makes you look best. Yes. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Right. Right, this next one, I mean, you've touched on all of these in the introductory uh, comments, Terry. We've got three questions here, all variations on a theme. Ashley Boomin says he's very confident Fundsmith is good at identifying buying decisions, but how good are you at selling? Do you track sales posi positions after they've left the portfolio against a random sell decision to see whether the fund makes sales at the right time rather than simply to free up capital for a better buying decision? Uh, Augusto Ramos asks, given the higher than usual exit SAS of recently, Intuit, PayPal, Adobe, Amazon, do you feel these mistakes happen because you went outside your comfort zone? And then Ishan Hemant Pimpal uh, says, uh, what is the main rationale behind selling Amazon shares? We touched on that, Terry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, look, they're all pretty much in the same area. Um, there's the, the um, sales that they're, uh, they're talking about, PayPal, Adobe, Amazon, Estee Lauder. We do actually spend a lot of time uh, and effort uh, and emotional kind of energy thinking about things that we could do better. Because right? nobody's ever perfect. My, my quote for you, I don't know if any of you have watched, it, have watched the Netflix series uh, Six Nations Full Contact, but I like, I like that quote from Andy Farrell, the Irish uh, coach who said, um, you've got to be able to deal with the highs and lows of the game. That is the game. It's not about perfection, it's about how you react to things. It's the same with us. We'll never get this perfect. It's one of the things that you carry with you when you do this job. What we can do, though, is do it better. React to the things that come up and do it better. So, yeah, we do look at uh, our cells. And if we look at those four cells, so we've got two which have gone really well and two which have gone really badly. At that point, in thinking about it, I was a bit stumped. So what's the difference, basically? And even within them, we could have sold the PayPal and Estee Lauder a bit early, quite a bit earlier, I think, and done even better in that regard. So there wasn't a common theme. If half your cells are good and half your cells are bad, what to do? The only thing we could sift out of this between us looking at what's happened is um, what really drove a very large part of this last year was the Magnificent Seven type uh, of thing. I know, you know this one's not in the Magnificent Seven, but the hype if that's what it is, surrounding AI, was a very big part of it. And I think you're going to come on and ask us about that in a minute. Um, and the Magnificent Seven, the momentum that you had in those stocks as well. When you're thinking of selling something, even if your reasoning is right, and I think our reasoning fundamentally in Adobe and Amazon was right, if you can see an enormous tailwind going on in, for some reason, even if it's a very spurious tailwind, don't do anything. Sit on your hands for a while. You just have to, that's the one big thing that we learned, that when, when we're selling things, and there was no tailwind to support paper, there's no tailwind to support Estee Lauder, worked fine. With these ones, we basically got in the way of a truck at the top of a hill that someone let the hand break off. And, uh, and, and as a result, it wasn't the, our finest hour in terms of selling them. So we do try to do that, and that was the immediate lessons that I think we, uh, we took from the, the outcome. I, I just might pick up on um, uh, Augusto Ramos's question. And, yeah, and, and, and the concept of, because when he talks about outside our comfort zone, mm, yeah, it's, a good point. it's interesting, as to, uh, uh, maybe he's here, but what he actually thinks our comfort zone is. And what I suspect he means is uh, outside of things like consumer staples and healthcare, things that he's 
accustomed to seeing in the portfolio. And, and the way that we try to define a good company is, is in respect of what the numbers look like, how the company makes its money, and, and whether we can understand what I call a simple path to growth. And so if you take Intuit, if any of you own a small business, which I'm so sure some of you do, 10, 20 years ago, you used to do your accounts via uh, receipts in a shoebox, maybe on an Excel spreadsheet if you were particularly advanced. And, and it doesn't seem to us to be particularly uh, outside of our comfort zone in terms of understanding that a small business doing their accounts that way might, as people become more uh, technology literate, uh, and want to get more organized, that they might actually want to use a QuickBooks uh, product. So, so we don't particularly, I don't think we really would, uh, I, I think we would push back at the premise of the question um, that these were, quote, outside of our comfort zone. And, um, and Terry always has a, a, a thing I can't remember about, um, about can you explain the workings of... Uh, oh, yeah. People sometimes say to us, um, I said to it most recently in AI, ah, well... You see, the problem is you don't actually understand how AI works. And I say, actually, there's an awful lot more in, in the way that things work that you don't understand, which we've got to uh, master and accept. Uh, the one I always use is I say, never mind AI and how that works, or how computer graphics work, and so on. Um, how about surfactants? You know, the stuff that you use to clean your bathroom and your kitchen. Could you explain the chemical uh, reaction that, that's basically involved in a surfactant for me? This is a pretty basic product. And the answer, of course, is for the vast majority of people, including us, no. But we know they work. Yeah. We're pretty confident that they work, and we know the people who make them. Yeah? Great stuff. James Young has a question here. Uh, the late, great Charlie Munger once said, any year that passes in which you don't destroy one of your best-loved ideas is a wasted year. Terry, with 14 years of Fundsmith under your belt, what investment idea or be investment belief have you changed your mind on which you think has been to the benefit of the fund? Well, I can't think of one at the moment that I've changed my mind on that's the benefit of the fund. Uh, that's, I'll perhaps leave Julian to have a crack at that if he fancy it in a moment. But the, uh, the, the one thing that I haven't quite changed my mind on, but I'm sort of, um, uh, I'm playing with it, is I think I've found a bank that we like. Now, as you probably know, we're both bank analysts in our, in our youth, um, and we've got a very long list of reasons, which we've written down and published and waxed lyrical on about why you should never own banks. We've found one we like. And I'm sitting there at the moment wondering what to do about that. <laughs> um, you know, uh, in, in, in the event that we buy it, I am going to quote the, uh, the great um, uh, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger's uh, business partner, who said, sometimes a man must rise above principle. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's an investment that we have a high level of certainty will work for reasons uh, that we won't go into now because we haven't bought the thing yet. <laughs> and right. we may never buy it, I don't know, we, but we may buy it. Uh, then that, that would be it, I think, for me. Wow. So the, the, the thing, one of the things I thought to do was, given that Charlie had uh, made the comment, I wonder what he'd actually uh, said in answer, that, yeah. in answer to his own question. Um, that's, what, that's why he's in charge of research, you see. And, and the, the first part of this is slightly dull, but the second part might get a chuckle. So he said, I know so many people whose main problem in life is that the old ideas, the old ideas displace the entry of new ideas that are better. Um, he says, and then he goes on to say, now it's a good thing that we have that problem in marriage, that may be good for the stability of marriage that we stick with our old ideas. But in most fields, you want to get rid of your old ideas. Um, so, um, the, I mean, I, I think one of the points of the question is that, that, that one of the things about, I mean, and, and, and I think we've all known that about some fund managers, is they really fall in love with their companies. They almost treat their companies like their children. Um, and, and if you try to persuade them to, uh, to sell one of their companies, uh, it's almost like trying to persuade them to sell one of their children. And, and then there are certain dangers, especially get you, when you get to a certain size. So you, you get to know the chief executive, you, you, you have his or her email, you get to the CFO, you know, they know the name of your kids, and you get very cosy with them. And it becomes tremendously difficult to actually extricate yourself from what might not be the right financial position for the fund. And I think we... We have actually been good at that, and, and as very simple evidence, uh, although we, we like to go on about the number of stock, the, the, the average length of holding period, and the amount of time we've, uh, the number of stocks that we've held for a long period of time, 
Uh, I think on, if, if you take the, the, the number of stocks that we owned either on the first day in November 2010 or in the, in the year afterwards, that was probably a number in the high 20s, and, and only five of those are left. So we, we have, over time, engaged in a certain amount of rotation. And, and I think we are, we are I, I think just to hear us say it should be somewhat comforting. We are very aware. We don't really want to sort of get to know our chief executives by their first name or anything like that. No. No, no. And look, we do, the, the shape of things has changed over time in the portfolio, and I think will continue to change probably over time. And it does reflect that. If you look back to 14 years ago, half the fund was in consumer staples. You know, now we're in the 20s. It's about half that. And that is a reflection of the fact that we found other things, but it's also a reflection of the fact that we become increasingly aware, and I know we've got questions that relate to this as well, of some of the problems of consumer staples that uh, they've faced, which are, have grown in some cases over time and are perhaps still growing over time. So we do uh, actually get out there and look at our ideas and see whether uh, they still persist. And ditto with things that we said we wouldn't own. So that's something we did own, it's come down. Things, you know, if you attended our meetings or talked to us in the early years, we were pretty anti investing in drug companies. And we had lots of reasons why we didn't like the, uh, the kind of outcomes for drug companies in terms of the drug discovery process uh, and how badly it was working uh, out there. Um, and then we bought Novo Nordisk. Also fair to say that, that uh, if you read the, the, the biography of uh, the Walter Isaacson biography of Warren Buffett, um, there's a moment uh, in that when, which would have been like 1998, when Charlie Munger uh, says to Warren Buffett that Coca-Cola's on 40 times earnings and that uh, he, should, he should consider selling it. And I think Buffett calls it one of his inevitables. Mm -hmm. And so I think that w one of, the, one of the, the senses you get from that is that is that Charlie Munger f not fought a battle, but was always, um, was always getting at Buffett to actually think about these sort of things. Yeah. We didn't make it up because we didn't prepare anything for this, but there's a wonderful quote from Buffett about Coca-Cola, where he's, uh, he quotes, it says, every year, some you know, upstanding, well-qualified, do you know this one? Financial analyst or commentator says, Coca-Cola, it's all over, you know, nobody wants fizzy, you know, sort of drinks anymore, nobody wants flavoured colas anymore, and uh, valuation's too high, and uh, you've got to sell it. And uh, you think, yeah, that's very sensible. And he says, look how well it's done. Then he points out that it's a quote from Forbes magazine in 1929. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's utterly <coughs> remarkable. Uh, you know? So as much as it's, I think what Charlie Munger says is right there, there are some things you don't need to break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Right, here comes the AI question from Y. Lee. Oh, AI. Anyway. How does Fundsmith view investing AI? Well, I thought we'd get all biblical at this point. There's my, there's my biblical quote for you on how we view investment in AI. Uh, Corinthians 13, 12, through a glass, darkly. We, uh, we're a long way from convinced that we, uh, we can predict what's going to happen uh, in terms of AI, unlike some people who seem to think they're got it all sussed immediately. If you read the annual letter, you'll see that one of the things I pointed out, obviously we've got early um, uh, uh, interest in, in shares in AI, NVIDIA being the, the most obvious, uh, but also quite a lot in, in others, some of our stocks like Microsoft and Alphabet, some of the others that we've sold like um, uh, Adobe and so on and Intuit, uh, and you've got this great upsurge. But if you look back to the early leaders uh, in other sectors of tech over the last mm, 30 years, could you rely upon picking up the early leader and just running with that. Well, Intel and microchips, I mean, they're still around, but they've struggled quite badly in recent years, Intel, uh, with a, a, an attempt to be both, you know, to be a rejectable fabulous as a designer and, and a, manu a maker, of, uh, a fabricator of chips. Uh, AOL, America Online in Internet Service Providers, the entire concept doesn't exist anymore. Right? It's, it, basically, we're talking about a telecoms company. Uh, Nokia in, in mobile phones. Um, uh, Yahoo in search engines, obviously uh, Google is now in. Uh, BlackBerry, or the, the company that was Research in Motion in smartphones. Um, and MySpace in social media. MySpace was there before Facebook. All of them lost the position, basically. So we really don't feel that we, and probably anybody else, is at this stage able to pick winners for you. And in any event, just to be going on from there, we're not even convinced there's going to be a winner. Uh, from the whole thing. One of the people when we were a bank analyst that we most admired as a manager was uh, the late Sir Brian Pittman, who was a great manager, he thought, at Lloyd's Bank. 
and who steadfastly refused to do what other banks were doing, which was take part in the big bang, race to own brokers and jobbers and merchant banks. Uh, and when asked to explain this, he had a number of things that he said, but one of them was he said, some markets don't produce any winners. And he was absolutely right, I think, about that. Um, and it's the same with this. Maybe there won't be a winner uh, from this. Maybe that won't emerge. In any case, we don't yet know how the business model will work, if at all, for uh, large language models and AI, uh, and what it will do. So, well, we know that there are models, and we know that there are people who are building those, like OpenAI, and we know that they're, op uh, that they're being installed uh, and, and put out there into the market by people like Microsoft, by Copilot and so on. But when people get terribly excited about something like uh, Adobe and send the price up 40% because, oh, yeah, this is great, it's good, won't they get charged for the AI? I mean, so they're not owning the model, are they? And they're not even supplying it in the first instance. That's going to come from somebody like Microsoft supplying the operating systems. So, first of all, they haven't, nobody has yet defined how Adobe will make another cent from its customers by supplying this. Maybe it will. But even if it does, won't some of the sense accrue to the people who actually develop this and own it and, and, and are supplying it? Um, and then you get to the point, which I mentioned in the annual letter, if everybody's got it, nobody's got it. There may be no competitive advantage if everybody's got it. The, the analogy which I borrowed from Warren Buffett um, and uh, elaborated on, he uses a, a street parade, for his example. I use a, a football stadium, you know. The, the striker runs into the penalty area with the ball. Uh, the second row stand up so they can get a better row over the front row. And uh, 30 seconds later, absolutely everybody in the stadium is standing up. Nobody's got a better view than they had before. They're just less comfortable. Uh, and maybe all we're going to get here is, a, is something which goes out into the world, which does provide a product enhancement in, in a number of areas to uh, consumers and businesses, but nobody net makes a great return out of it. So we don't know. I think there's a long, you know, it'll probably be a long time uh, before we're confident that we know who the winners are if there are any. You look like you're going to say something. Yeah? I was just going to say um, that although it's quite hard to identify the winners, one thing that you also need to do is to think about the losers. Yeah. Because even though there are sometimes no winners, there's almost always some big losers. Mm. So if you were to say, who have been the benefit? Who have been the beneficiaries of the internet? Well, I mean, it'd be hard to say, but I mean, presumably, people who were sort of printers or who, who did classified advertising probably didn't. Who have been the beneficiaries of digital photography? Hard to say, but Kodak probably wasn't a, a great thing. Who's been the benefit of digital money? Um, hard to say, but presumably, if you printed cash. Um, yeah. That's not very well. good. So, so uh, I mean, one of our things is, is to is, is not only to try and play, as we say in America, play offense, but also play some decent defense. Yeah. Mm. Great stuff. Thanks for that. Jeremy Wallace is a very long-standing investor. He says, uh, I'd like to know why the fund continues to hold positions in some long-standing underperforming companies. And here he's inviting you to have a, a good old kick at Unilever again. I am in particular referring to Unilever, which never seems to have got over its mayonnaise mission. <laughs> well, I mean, I'd like to ask why the fund continues to hold them. Trust me, I ask myself from time to time, <laughs> very, very frequently. Yeah. Uh, when things are underperforming, Julian will tell you, a phrase I use when we're looking at them on the Bloomberg and uh, something that's been underperforming, I say it's a, a gift that keeps gift on that giving. Keeps on giving yes. A gift that keeps on giving. So, yeah, we do sit and think, worry, indeed, uh, about this. Um, uh, and let, let's, uh, you said in, I'm being invited to have a go at Unilever again, just for the avoidance of doubt, not that it probably will avoid anything, uh, since we've almost certainly got some journalists in the room. Please, can we think before we write, Terry Smith a t a savages Unilever again? I'm just trying to answer a question here, right? Um, and actually, for what it's worth, we think the new management probably is pretty decent, and, uh, and we're... We think that they, uh, they're doing the right things. The reason we continue to own it is because we think the company's okay. It's the management that was the problem. Um, and, you know, it's a, it, we can change management, and indeed they have changed management. So let's explore that for a moment. Is Unilever a strong business of the sort that we think, you know, has... Because we not only look at numbers, an awful lot of what we do is numbers, and it's an easy way to represent things to you. Returns on capital employed, gross margins, uh, operating margins, cash conversion, growth rates, etc. One of the things you might think, oh, well, they just do the numbers. I think you, you're never going to get it right if you just do that. You need to understand why the business is capable of producing good numbers. What's, what's the reason that it can, it, it can do that? Because if you don't understand that, it may stop doing it in a moment for a reason you don't understand. Is Unilever a good business capable of doing this? It's got 14 
uh, 1 billion euro brands. It's quite a lot, isn't it? It's got 14 of the top 50 brands in the world in fast-moving consumer goods. It's got three brands with over 4 billion euros, Dove in sales, Dove, Nor, and Omo. Um, it's got, etc. Three brands with sales between two and four billion, Rexona, Walls, and Hellman's. Uh, eight brands over a billion. You can see some of the brands there, Dove, Rexona, Magnum, uh, and Nor, etc. It's got very powerful brands, this company. Much more powerful brands, in our view, than some other companies that do better actually. How about distribution and things like that? It's got 61 billion euros in sales. Yeah? It's got 59% of its sales in emerging markets, which an awful lot of people will tell you is a critical source of growth in this area. You know, its top five markets are the USA, India, China, Brazil, and Indonesia. Three of those are the world's top three democracies. Right? In there. It's quite interesting, I think, for you. Three and a half billion, 3.4 billion people around the world use a product every single day. Half the world's population picks up one of these things, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got a very strong brand portfolio in a business with very strong distribution, handicapped by management, okay? Here's a few examples of the handicaps. Reorganizations, in 2010, they announced their, the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. 2016, we had Connected for Growth. Obviously, someone hadn't lost their sense of irony in coming up with that one. Um, in 2022, we went for the Unilever Compass Strategy for Sustainable Growth. Right? Really? Good businesses don't do this stuff. They don't keep reorganizing constantly, and they certainly don't think that snappy titles are the answer. How about their strategy in terms of organic growth versus acquisitions? In 2014, we were told it was bolt-on acquisitions between 1 and 2 billion euros, uh, some of which were disastrous. Dollar Shave Club, for example, which was a billion uh, uh, euro acquisition, which disappeared pretty much without trace. But in January 22, we switched tack, and they were going to go for a big one. They came and said that they wanted to buy the GSK, the GlaxoSmithKline consumer business, which has been spun out as Halyard, the over-the-counter medicines business, for 50 billion pounds. I haven't looked up the market value because they didn't get it. They were, uh, the, uh, the shareholders, including us, didn't like the idea of that. But when I last looked, it was about 30 billion pounds. Uh, it would have been a disastrous destruction of value. Now, we're on organic growth under the new management, which, by the way, I think is the right strategy. Uh, on for How about names? So one of their divisions went from being personal care to beauty and personal care to beauty and well-being. How did that help exactly? Um, uh, one of the divisions went from being savoury dressings and spreads to foods to food and refreshment to nutrition. Anyone think any of this helps? Uh, really a focus on selling more stuff to more people might have been what they could, should have gone for, you would have thought, you know. And um, what did this lead to in financial performance? Here's a, a table that just shows a few metrics over the years. 20, 2008 as a point, 2018 and 2023. The return on invested capital, you can see back here, was 15.7%. Did have a bit of a lift, but is now, that's basically flatlined. Gross margin was 47%. Then it was 43, then it was 42. This margin, which we say is the big protection for import cost inflation, down. Operating margin did have a tick up, now below that level. So these metrics are poor, I would say. That's an inadequate return um, and, uh, and deteriorating. Sales growth in the years 2009 to 2018, so the years here were 2.2%, pretty anemic, frankly. And then in 2018 to 2023, 0.5%. Wow. What a, bad, what a bad outcome for a company with such strong brands and such good distribution. I haven't chosen, or we haven't chosen those dates at random. You know, that was when Mr. Polman became chief executive, and that's when Mr. Joke took over, basically. And that's what you got. I'll leave you to judge whether you think that was a, a good uh, outcome or not. I'm obviously, for the avoidance of the commentators present taking notes, not casting any judgment whatsoever on it. We think this is basically a potentially very good business. Uh, that's just not been managed properly. Can I just pick on uh, something that, that Mr. Wallace asked, just because it was actually part of what I'm going to say is somewhat of an answer to a question before, which is um, the concept that we continue to hold positions in some long-standing underperforming companies. Um, and he's right. Um, but if you take the companies that we've owned since inception, which, you, which have certainly performed less well than the fund, we've got Philip Morris International, which has done nearly 10 and a half, Diageo's done just over 10, Pepsi's done 11 and a half, Unilever's actually done uh, 9.7. Um, whereas, but if you know some of the things that we've booted out along the way, so Colgate, Kimberly-Clark, 3M, 
Imperial Brands, Reckitt, Benckiser, Nestle, they have all done significantly worse. So I would say that our, and, and the other thing is that even though these consumer companies and others have actually underperformed, I mean, for a consumer company to compound at 10 or 11% is not bad. Uh, I mean, you're not going to get 20%. So I would say that I would push back again that, I mean, I know we've got Unilever, but I think that our record in terms of holding on to uh, long-standing underperforming companies is actually relatively good. Thanks, Jules. Next question from Ward Imink. If you reflect and look further out, I and mean, this is a related question, do you believe the brand value of consumer staples companies is getting impaired by the rise of private labels? Very topical question. I need today the Kantar uh, latest till roll data pointed out that own label brands are outselling well-known brands. Yeah, okay. It's private label is a complex subject, in my view, um, or a more complex subject than the simple, oh, well, people trade down to private brands. Um, just show you some data on it. Private label share by company and by category. It's kind of interesting. Um, you can see low shares in own label in things like toothpaste, beer, whiskey, chocolate, okay? And quite, I mean, this is an outlier, frozen vegetables. It's been highly commoditized, I would say. It's an outlier. Um, and very high in baby diapers. And basically, if you put things in your mouth, you're quite worried about whether it's good. And if you put it on your baby's bottom, you're less concerned, funnily enough. Uh, in fact, looking at the companies, even if you put it on your own bottom, you're less concerned. Because you look at the private label share by, by um, uh, company, Coca-Cola, yeah, obviously things you consume, PepsiCo, Colgate, things you consume, Kimberly Clark, tissues and so on, very high indeed. Um, and obviously, it's not just the fact that you consume these and you do care about what you put in your mouth. It's also the fact that they're, they are companies with very powerful brands uh, out there. Um, and so, look, it, it's not that there's a uniform share of private label, either in companies or in categories. It varies. It depends where you are uh, in the market. Um, the other thing about it is when people trade down, uh, which you know, quite a lot of people have, have been forced to by the, uh, the inflation that we've experienced in the last few years and I was, you know, I, I, even I'm frankly shocked by a grocery bill sometimes when I, I go to the supermarket, um, that um, the choice isn't always to go to own labels. Sometimes you change the retail venue. You, know? you go for uh, uh, buying something, not in, uh, in Waitrose, but you go and buy it in Aldi or Little, basically. Um, sometimes you do stay with a brand, but you go with a cheaper brand. Tide Pods are a premium price brand, but if you go to OxyClean, which is a Church and Dwight brand, you get a pretty good result, so you go to that. A name label is one of the choices, but it's not the only choice that people have got. Um, last, we've got some actual data here, because the question is about have they grown in recent times and are they more of a threat than usual? Um, one of the companies in our portfolio is Church and Dwight, and they helpfully produce quite a lot of data on, uh, on private label, and you can see here we've got data for the last 10 years from them on pregnancy testing kits, baking soda, gummy vitamins, uh, toothache medications, clumping litter, cat litter, uh, and mouthwash. And I would suggest to you that this shows a number of things. One is private label isn't actually gaining. There isn't any sign of that with it, within these categories. Secondly, my thing about things you put in your mouth being pretty safe would appear to be the case, uh, things for toothache. And finally, pregnancy testing kits have got a very high percentage of own label, and we've always puzzled about that, and I think it is if you're getting pregnancy tested and you're a bit worried about being pregnant, getting a cheap one means that you might get the wrong result and you'll feel a bit cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> what do I know? So I think it's a bit more complex. Uh, I mean, you're not entirely wrong, the questioner, at all, but I'm not suggesting that for a moment. Trading through other venues, depending on what category you're in, and depending on how powerful your brand is, can all affect the outcome. It's not a simple, well, it's all getting worse. Next question comes from Gary Monaghan. Love this question. I mean, again, it's a company that you touched on in, in your introductory remarks. Last year at this meeting, you selected Meta as the portfolio company with the most upside potential. We did. Yeah. yeah. Which portfolio stock would you select this year? Um, so just to say that when we were sitting here last year, we were coming off a year when we had some, some big falls in uh, a lot of our companies. So Microsoft was down, had been down 29% in uh, 2022. Uh, Apple was down 27%. Alphabet was down 39 uh, Colorplus was down 29 Even L'Oreal was down 20 And Meta was down 64%. 
And one of the things that we always say is, uh, if you're not excited, if you're not most excited by the things that have fallen the most, then why are you still owning them? Um, so, so there was a certain almost logic in, in, in us saying what we actually did. Um, in, as we sit here today, we're obviously coming, uh, coming off a year when a lot of those things have recovered very significantly. So I think the first thing is that the, for 2024 itself as a 12-month period, I think the, um, I, I doubt you're going to get the same percentage increases as you have done, uh, like the, I think 194% in, in Meta mm. uh, in the last year. So I think that's, but, I, but, but personally, um, and again, maybe not with respect to 2024, but I think for the first time ever, the, the, the portfolio company with the most upside potential, I think, could well be Unilever. Um, because it is a uh, uh, it is an unloved business. Uh, it's had all the issues we've been through, but it looks, in terms of its rating and in terms of the potential and in terms of the things that the company is doing, it looks to me to have uh, quite a lot going for it. So I'm 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 going to go with either that or Metla Toledo, which happened to be the worst performer uh, in percentage terms over the last year uh, and is a very good business. I agree with him. Um, just to elaborate on that, on, on that slightly, I mean, on, on Unilever, apart from the fact that it's lowly rated and has clearly had these issues with management changing the names of things and reorganising things and all those kind of fine things, um, the new management team seems to us to be grasping things quite well um, and in particular laying out that they want to become the best version of what they are that they could be, which sounds a slightly... But it's like benchmarking what they are in terms of the food business and the household cleaning products business and the personal care business against the best other performers in the market and getting to that level before buying and selling things uh, you know, largely. You know. And I think that's exactly what they should be doing, basically. So look, I, uh, I think we, we obviously wish them well because we're still a shareholder. Uh, and I think that they're showing very good form in it initially. Vote of confidence in Heinz Schumacher there. Yeah, 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 yes, actually, yeah, yeah. Well, this is uh, from Desmond Brady. Julian, this is one for you. Uh, at last year's meeting, you suggested Adyen as a business of interest that Fundsmith would like to buy, but it was too expensive. Since then, its price has dropped by over 50%. What's the reason for the decision not to purchase at a more attractive valuation, and is it still in the investable universe? So, so one of the things that we say uh, that we look for in terms of buying a stock that, that's in the investable universe but not in the portfolio. Terry uses the word a glitch. And, and I think that a glitch has two characteristics, which is one of them is certainly that something has caused the share price to fall quite significantly, which gives you your valuation or pricing opportunity. But the other thing about a glitch is the market thinks it's a real problem, but actually underlying nothing has changed. And I think the problem we had with uh, Adyen um, is that something had changed. I mean, first of all, the, the, business, the business was growing at 50, 100% before COVID uh, and is now slowed down quite considerably. So, I mean, there's certainly reasoning why Adyen should be cheaper, more lowly rated, or whatever you care to call it, than it, than it was before. Secondly, the, the payment space, as evidenced by people like PayPal, and I know they don't do the same thing as PayPal, but uh, as evidenced by PayPal, has become, I think, more complicated. And then thirdly, uh, to go back to a point that Terry made earlier, one of the, thing, one of the things about uh, a glitch is that it normally takes the share price down, say, 10 to 20%. Adyen's share price fell 77%. Which is in a day, well, <laughs> about. which is kind of alarming um, and uh, makes you uncomfortable. So, in the, in, I mean, in the short term, the price went from thirteen hundred to six hundred, and is now back to or fourteen hundred to six hundred, and is now back to where it was before. It's, it's quite amusing, actually. It's one of those stocks that if you if you were here last year and you looked at the share price again today, you wouldn't think that anything had happened in the course of the year. But I, th I think that something has happened. So it does remain in the investable universe. We continue to track it. Hopefully, as we get to know it better uh, or better and better, we will, if, if another opportunity like this yeah. comes along, we, we might buy it, but maybe not. Yeah. And I, I think one of the fundamental things that struck us when we were looking at the, the announcement that um, 
led to the very, very sharp share price fall was whether or not in our original thinking we had underestimated the ease of relatively frictionless switching. It's at the, in the payments business, it's at the merchant acquiring end um, of it. So, you know, when you pay with something, uh, the, basically the, the store, whatever, uh, supplier has to get, their, to get the money into their bank account, has to go to a merchant acquirer, quite often a bank to get the, the transaction processed, basically. And that's an area which is quite low margin, so, you know, a little bit of worry about if anything goes wrong when you're on low margins. And we think that it dem what went wrong may have demonstrated that the ability, first of all, that an awful lot of people are multi-banked, if you like, in that, that they deal with more than one, and that the friction involved in switching was low. And those, until we've got an answer to that, it doesn't get into the, yeah, we definitely want to own this business account. Great stuff. Right, we're at the uh, last question of the evening. And, uh, We've already made reference to uh, Charlie Munger once this evening. David Bidell asks, does Fundsmith have a Charlie Munger, someone perceptive, honest, and blunt? <laughs> <laughs> Leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, um, just to uh, reiterate what I said at the beginning, thank you for all of your questions. We, have, we do get hundreds every year. Uh, we can't answer them all on the night. But uh, if your question hasn't been answered, the Fundsmith team will be in touch with you with an answer. Uh, we do appreciate your support uh, and your fantastic turnout this evening. A lot of work goes into these uh, meetings. So if you could give a big round of applause, please, not only for the Fundsmith team, but for Julian and Terry. Thank you. Thank you.